Hey, House for All Things Dentistry, the place where we're passionate about sharing those hints and tips of dentistry. And if you're new here, take a look around. This I think this website's been on my channel, has been up since about 1895. So we got a whole bunch of stuff on here uh, just through learning from a lot of mentors and great friends. Uh, colleagues have been doing this for a long time. I've been doing dentistry for about two decades now. So I'm never too old to learn. So I'm doing this presentation. Um, online and I was talking about rubber dams and you know what's happened is that I've rubber dams are pretty critical it's a standard of care in uh, by the American Association of Anodontists for root canals and here you can see me putting this rubber dam on dam, there's our two I'm talking uh, placing rubber dam on this endo module pro just we're doing some demonstrations here Placing rubber dam is pretty simple. That is pretty much all it took. We got this. So the essentials are: we've got a clamp, we've got our you know plastic, we've got a piece of rubber, and then we've got our frame. Uh, and then, then we've you know we've isolated the tooth. We're preventing files and other sharp objects from going down the patient's throat and they're into their lungs, their respiratory system. We're also preventing our caustic irrigants, also known as bleach, to going into the mouth. And then we also prevent bacteria ingress into our tooth. So three pretty important reasons why, because two, we want to have the best outcome for doing root canals. So um, when I was doing this presentation, I was looking online at, okay, like, let's take a look at what's needed. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, at the end, we'll go through this case that I'm talking about. So this patient presented with an acute apical abscess, and we, were, we started both uh, the, the eight and the six in terms of doing endodontic therapy. Now, you can argue that the eight could be a guarded to hopeless prognosis, but at the moment, he had no other teeth to bite on, uh, so we just did the pulpectomy, and let's see how long we get out of that. Excuse me. <coughs> so all you need is a rubber dam punch, and go more expensive than cheap, because I've noticed that the really cheap ones don't last long. If you go more expensive, you seem to last a little bit longer. Um, if you use a frame, doesn't matter. You can use plastic. Plastic's radiolucent. Um, I just use whatever's essentially in the drawer for that's sterilized. That's uh, a metal or plastic. But the five rubber dam clamps that have served me well over the last five uh, 20 years for restorative and endo are these clamps here. Now the reason why I was looking at this because I look at this chart. I'm like, oh my gosh, no wonder why there's random clamps in people's drawers everywhere because there's like a thousand of them and if the dental assistant or if somebody who's ordering isn't a dentist you could get, end up with any goofy ones and really the thing i learned today was that i've been calling the 212 a range of anterior clamps so the 212 is the worst anterior clamp possible because there are no wings and what do i mean by wings it's got these little things here so when you're doing an anterior tooth, let's go with 4-1 full. So if we take a look here, when you're gonna go put the rubber dam on, we'll wait for my drive to fire up here. There we go. So you can see here, you know, interesting enough, I've labeled this tooth because I don't wanna have a patient safety incident. I want to make sure I'm putting the rubber dam on the right tooth. And this actually lines me up with the long axis of the tooth. So it's, it's a helpful reminder to make sure I put the rubber dam on the right tooth. So the rubber dam goes right on there, and this is the beauty of the 212, you know, the way, 212 or 211 clamp, not 212, 210, whatever. Anyways, the winged anterior clamp with this labial bow because you can put it all on at once. I'll take my spoon excavator, flick that out of the way, flick the rubber dam um, off the wing. Clink, 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 just like that. We're going to get it all set up. You can take some floss and floss that down. And then these little windows here, see this, this space here between the tooth? I'm gonna fill that in with a secondary seal, which is, uh, this is called opal dam. So it keeps our caustic irrigants out of the tooth, out of the, out of the mouth and bacteria out of the tooth. So that seals up right there. I'm starting to use more opal dam, uh, no, sorry, or seal. It's different product, don't have to, this is like curable. The other product you don't need to like cure and it's super sticky. <clears throat> and it actually expands when it's wet. So I actually prefer it more uh, than Opal Dam. But I've been using Opal Dam successfully for seven years. So as you can go through the access, there's our access. And you can see we're lining up. I'm using that long axis. Oh, I'm out of the screen here. So we're looking here. Anyways, 
let me know if you want to see this access down the road of this whole root canal. Um, my focus on today is just doing those rubber dam clamps. So using the winged version is really helpful for anteriors. So the 212, or the, yeah, the 212 without the wings is really complicated to put on. It's just frustrating. So when we're looking at rubber dam clamps, what I was taught was using the, the, the 12A, and literally I think about this, every time I go to put it on, it's like, hmm, I'm in quad two or quad four, I need a 12, just because there's a two in there and it's they're even numbers. If I'm in quad one and three, this is a 13 clamp, so I use a one and a three. <clears throat> and the beauty of these, and the beauty of the wing is really being able to put the rubber dam on at the same time as the frame. So as you can see, the whole mechanism goes on at the same time. Boom, just like that. Now the one mistake I did do here is that my dental assistant who worked with an anodontist years ago is that I didn't line up the top of the frame. This frame, these balls, if you do buy frames, don't buy these. I don't know why they have these balls on here. Buy ones with little pointy things like that at the top. Line up the frame, so you line the top of the frame with the top of the rubber dam, and then punch your hole right in the middle. Then you don't have this like goofy flap tissue here. I don't know if you've seen the movie Click, uh, but if you have, he's in Adam Sandler's in the hospital, and he looks at his. He's been sleeping there for a while. He loses a ton of weight, and then he talks about having this tongue in his belly, on his belly. So take a look at that, and he'll flap it. So if you Google Adam Sandler catch or click and then uh, hospital scene you'll see what I mean because it flaps back and forth this usually bugs the patient so I'm gonna place so then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place my secondary seal light carrot and then you're good to go so anything with a wing is really effective so that's how we use those the 2a clamp is is the the go-to there's a 2 and a 2a I find that the 2 is not I just learned today there's a difference between 2 and 2a so the 2 is a little bit weaker than the 2A. The 2A is like seems to be bulky. The 2A I use it for premolars, but I also use it for, in this case, this is <clears throat> my mistake, I'm human. So my friend Dana sent, sent me this case and um, I looked at, for, this is she just had this crown, this beautiful temporary crown and we're doing the root canal after about three months. The tooth is patient's symptomatic, not three months, like a week, a month. They're waiting to see it's a cracked tooth, waiting to see if it calmed down. It wouldn't. And then when I was looking at doing my exam, I'm like, wow, this is a beautiful temp. It, the margins are amazing. Like, wow, it's just amazing. And then I went to access it, like, man, this is not plastic. Don't worry, the little burr marks come off there. It's zirconia. I'm like, this is not, this is a temporary, this is the, now I understand. This is a zirconia crown cemented down with temp on. So yes, that is an error. I'm sorry, I'm human. We took the crown off, but once we take the crown off, so I was trying to get the crown off with the, so I use hemostats. I'm like, oh, maybe I can keep this rubber dam frame on, taking the crown off. And no, it all comes flying up. Boom, you just, <laughs> if you're still here, I'm giving you the secret of not what not to do. You'll watch the damn clamp go. So it comes flying off. And then this is where I use the 2A clamp. So here, it just it's small enough. There's probably lots of other clamps. I can't stand the 8 or the 14, which have little wings that dig deep into the gingiva. Just never gotten into those. But I find that with the 2A, I can put that on here. It's going to grab just sufficient enough of those prepar of the preparation. And then we're going to use, again, the Opal Dam. <coughs> Excuse me, I think there's a cat stuck in my throat. Um, we're going to use the Opal Dam to fill in any of these gaps. Ideally, I should have redone this um, rubber frame, as, uh, the, the rubber dam repunched it because it got stretched out. Uh, but now we're sealed up and good to go. So that's the 2A. So useful for premolars and situations like that. We talked about the 210 or the 9. And then this 5. Now this is a mandibular molar. I'd never even heard of it until about 5 years ago. I was working with a dental assistant who worked only with endodontists. And this clamp is amazing. So if you don't want to buy either of these, you can get this one. And it works for everything. Now, again, the reason why I'm looking at just doing this quick video is because there's so many options of different clamps. It gets really confusing. Um, I'd never, I, I don't think I've ever used the wingless because it doesn't make any sense in terms of efficiency to have to put the rubber dam on and then the clamp, but everyone's different. I'm not 
judging you. I'm just telling you what's worked with, for me. Uh, and the different dental assistants, actually it's the dental assistants who show me all these different clamps or the ones that I'm showing you today. So the, and then finally the whole reason, the three actually works well too, but I don't have any of those. I've, got, I've used it once, but definitely the five. I mean, everyone's got their different things. I think the thing is just use wings and it's way faster. Now, the whole reason why I wanted to do this video is because I remember I was doing a presentation a long time ago for an internal system uh, or own dental clinic and we're talking about rubber dam and doing dental you know doing root canals with a rubber dam is just not the way to go and I'm not trying to shame here but I guess deep down in my mind I am this is not acceptable I'm gonna say that right now you got to be using rubber dam this the problem with this is that this is again a sharp dart or an arrow that's gonna get lodged in the patient's throat or airway we you know, nobody goes to work to hurt people. We're here to help people. And this is such, be such a patient safety incident because I've, these have dropped, fallen out of my fingers and then, but the rubber dam was there to save it from going down in the patient's throat. That's the reason why it's there. And then irrigating with, let's be honest, it's bleach. We recommend full strength for vital teeth, you know, half or 1% for non-vital. There's literature, there's evidence to support that. Regardless, you don't want bleach in your mouth, and this is just not this is not the way to be doing dentistry, especially endodontics. Now, in the comments I was reading below, that in a lot of, one of the comments was that North America, or Americans use rubber dam, and I'd have to say rightly so. I mean, this is kind of, we're trying to keep, get the best outcome. The counter argument to that was that the patient is just doing a pulpectomy procedure, and then the patient, the final, endo is going to be using a rubber dam but in my mind like why not just put the rubber dam on for the whole darn thing um, and just get it over with and then it speeds everything up you're not dealing with this the possibility of getting into the patient's mouth anyways enough of that it's, it just makes me sad to see that to be honest so with regards to what we're talking about today this rubber dam let's just go through this case here <coughs> excuse me since we're here and you made it to this point you know, we'll go through Lynn. Um, Lynn was referred to me by uh, my great friend Dana. So this tooth was diagnosed with symptomatic irreversible papitis with normal apical tissues. It was just, it's cracked. They placed a crown. It didn't re relieve the, um, the symptoms. So let's just go ahead. This is just from last week, actually. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my long shank number four round burr, and we're going to make a slow preparation. But like anything else, we... This burr is slowly seeing the end of days, so we're going to discard that. I'm going to use a number two. And we're just going right, because it's a tooth number three, seven, we're going right into the center. And you can see, boom, we pop in. And the reason why I just make a little dot, so the two, the number two round long surgical burr has a diameter of one millimeter, so I make a little dot into the axis. Now you can see we've got a vital tooth. <clears throat> and then that, if the patient feels something, when I go ahead and pop through, what that allows me to do is take, you know, you can do an intrapulpal. And an intrapulpal, we know, works with pressure. So rather than having a huge access and trying to get lots of pressure in the large access, if we make a small hole, place our anesthetic syringe in there, we can place a lot of force and have minimal amount of irrigant or anesthetic come flying back out. So I'm going to use my endo zebra. Right here, if you have, if you never use an endo zebra, let me get this out of the way. It's a non non cutting tip, and then we're going to place that, and it just rides along the pulp chamber floor. Now, there's not much to see in my mirror. I'm just doing this by feel, pretty much, and you can see quickly we have removed most of our. We've got our access pretty much prepped, and then off we go. We kind of keep going there. Let's clean the mirror. Boom. So. It's fairly hyperemic. It gives me one indication that the tooth is fairly inflamed. So like we've talked about, irreversibly inflamed. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my Wavelength Gold Primary. So this is really the, the go-to that I use. I'm not sponsored by Dentsply. They don't want me to respond. They don't want to sponsor me, trust me. But this I've been using, and I love using it because this is how I find my orifices. So I'm gonna place that in there. I'm going to bend it. You see that bend? These are heat treated, just like most of our files today. I'm going to place that into the mesial canals. I'm going to hit the hit the hit the gas pedal, 
And then I'm going to remember this tooth. Normally, what I do is in a full regular tooth, I'm going to in my scouting stage, if you want to call it that, I'm going to go take this file to where the flutes stop. It gives me a quantitative measure. So we're about three millimeters shorter than that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it to approximately there. I'm going to see we got pulp tissue. We're good. I'm going to take that in the distal, get rid of some of the pulp tissue there. You can see it coming out. And I'm going to get a nice curve on it and try to get it into the mesiolingual. You can see that curve that I put it on there. But I don't think it goes in actually. I'm like, hmm. So we're gonna rinse that out, and you can see again the rubber dam keeps all every keeps the patient's irrigants keeps keeps the patient's oral the saliva out of the tooth, and it keeps my irrigants in the case. So there you can see what I'm doing here is I'm just irrigating everything out. I'm gonna take a look, and yes, I have two mesial canals. You can see them right there. So there's our buccal canal, and the reason why. I know it's buckles because I'm going to line it up right here and follow in the reflection and we're good. So I'm going to be looking for my mesiolingual. So I know it's there, it's right there, and I'm going to zoom in. Boom, you can see it's right there, it's got some pulp tissue in it. So we're going to bend, get a nice bend on that file. i use my mirror to place it in there and then go, so you see that curve again. And boom, in we go. So this is one of the problems I find of new dentists is trying to get the file in there. And with these heat treated files, so there's two issues. One, it's straight line access, and I'm not forming a straight line access as best as possible. I'm trying to keep this access a little bit more conservative. Uh, and the second is using, kind of moving the handpiece around and also bending the files at the right angles. Because what I find is that no one teaches you to push the rubber dam out with the handpiece to try to get a file in. And that's a super useful technique you can see here, I'm going to bring the handpiece over to the buckle to get more of a straight line access into that canal. I'm using to use my other hand to, to try to feel it and get it in there, and then we're good to go, and down it goes. So we're opening in, so you can see there's a pulp tissue coming out. I'm cleaning and shaping, literally I'm orifice opening. I'm opening, I'm cleaning and shaping the coronal two-thirds, which is a fairly standard technique, just to be able to get my hand files down and get working length. So you can see now all that pulp tissue's out. That was in like, well, we messed around. So let's say I'm going to be defensive on my side. So let's go with like, that was five minutes access or whatever you want to call it. Anyways, it was a short period of time. And now we've, we know we've got, we've got two canals and a large distal canal. We're using the law of symmetry, if you may. Krasner and Ranko from 2004. So this is a pulp tissue, pulp stone. They're going to flick out of there. Actually, I put it on my mirror and I said I, this is a gift for my dental assistant. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is we're just double checking, make sure we've got, we're going to irrigate all this junk out of there. Then I'm going to aspirate my irrigant. So watch what happens is I'm going to pull back on my irrigating syringe and it's going to suction it out, suction it out suction it out of the distal, and then I'm gonna go for my working length. So what that does is it takes all this, I mean, you can get your dental scissors just to suction it out too, but it gets rid of the irrigant, which is connecting all three of these canals. And it really monkeys up your apex locator, especially if there's a restoration here or you've got caries, that can really frustrate you all day long. So we're gonna take my hand file, I'm gonna take, I start with the number six, you could actually, because this is a shorter tooth, you could go with a shorter length file, uh, 21. Actually, I lied. I'm going to take my Munzpur, and we're just going to trough for middle mesial. The likely probability is pretty low as a middle mesial in a 3.7, but we're just going to make sure it's not it, nothing's there. We want to get success in these teeth. And actually, what you're seeing here is there's some pulp tissue, because I haven't opened up the entire pulp chamber there's pulp tissue hiding underneath the horn here. So that's what you're seeing actually come out of there. So we're gonna remove some of that mechanically. Our irrigant will get rid of most of that. But the problem is, is that even after 20 minutes, I find that the pulp tissue just still remains. You can see pulp tissue like right there. It still remains hiding and it's like protected. It's almost like it's protected by the dentin. So it's really important to remove all of this pulp tissue and don't assume that your, your irrigant's gonna break it down in the pulp chamber. That's been my experience, that I go to finish a case and I'm like, man, there's still pulp tissue hiding there. 
will affect the outcome of the entire case? I don't know, but let's just try to make it as best as possible. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a Munzburr and I'm literally troughing between the two mesial canals. Let's see if I can get a really good video here. Actually, I'm done troughing. We're just removing more of that pulp tissue. And I'm removing minimal amount of tissue. You know what's really effective using an ultrasonic handpiece to do this? Um, I don't routinely use an ultrasonic for standard endo. I use it for retreats, but standard endo, don't really find a use for it. You can art, I mean, do you use, you know, in the question, in the comments, do you use ultrasonic for endo? I find it's just another thing to pull out of the box. Okay, so there we go. We can see, I think we zoom in here, maybe not. So now we're going to do what I was going to say is you can see now we've troughed between the two mesial canals. I don't have an act. You'll see this later on in the video, um, but there is no extra canal. There's no white line or no white dot, which indicates a potential another canal. And then we're going to place our file. Now you see how I'm using my cotton forceps. The first time I tried to put a file in here, it was it's far back. The patient can't open a lot, and it's really complicated to get it. Because you're going to fumble around. And I'm trying to make this as efficient as possible. So I've got a bend on the file. I'm going to place my, use my cotton forceps. And then boom. Then I'm in. And then I use my fingers. And you can't see much because you're going to see my fingers. Um, I didn't get any movement in, my, in the mesial lingual. Usually I'll start with the mesial lingual because it's typically the straighter canal. But nothing. I didn't get a bite. So I wasn't very happy. Um... <clears throat> Not, I didn't get down to working length. There's my apex locator. So what I'm looking for with my apex locator, since we're here, is we're looking in vital cases. Normally, I'm just going to go to the the first green bar. Now I've been taught to go to the red bar. Let's see if I can get it here. Right. Not four red bars, but just one red bar. Let's slowly make it right. Boom. I've been taught to go to one red bar and then subtract either half a millimeter or subtract one millimeter. These are not one millimeter increments. They're not millimeter increments, but I find that just doing this, a couple videos online that I've done, I found that subtracting a millimeter from one red bar does equate to one millimeter short. So in vital cases, normally I'm just going to go right to here. This is the Airpex from Eight Teeth. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them, but what I do want to tell you is that I've been using this for a year and it's been bomb proof. And I prefer this over any of the other Apixel kitters I have. I find that it's just much more easy to put in my Tupperware container and put it back in the drawer uh, at the end of the day. So that's what I'm doing with my Apex locator is I'm going right down to that length. We're going down to one red bar. Uh, we're going to just the green, but it doesn't really matter. The key point here is that you can see I'm using my cotton forceps with a bend on that file to come into the mesial. You'll see there, I can't remember if that was a distal, yeah, distal canal. If I can't get anything on the mesial, I'll go right to the distal and make myself feel good. Now, this is really funny. So I'm not getting a reading on my apex locator. I'm like, what the heck? And I couldn't see this because I was looking from the side, but what I've done is I've actually lassoed the smaller rubber part. So lesson here, my dentist is like, no, you've got the handle. I'm like, that's impossible. But it is possible. So you can see how I'm struggling. And to prevent that struggle, the best way to do that, and I'll show you later on. So I, look at this. I'm still monkeying around with it on the handle. I've never done that, actually. And it's just because the patient couldn't open very well. So I usually try to hit the metal on the side of the file and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm way out because I've sunk that down to 20 mils, 24 mils on a, you know, on a crown tooth. So there we are getting our working length. <clears throat> so what I'll do normally is before I place the file, I don't know why I didn't do this, before I place the file in the tooth, I push the rubber dam, or the, the uh, rubber stop down just a millimeter to be able to prevent exactly what I did. I was hooking around that. Um, you can also place your place the file clip holder from the apex locator onto your file and place it into the tooth. Uh, that also works. That would actually work probably just as well as my cotton forceps in this case. So here we are, cotton forceps. I'm going down the mesial buckle. There we go there, and it just drops to length. You're like, boom, that's the best feeling right there. We're in, get working length. It is an eight file, so I'm kind of like, eh. 
working like this should be okay. It is a little bit small. Usually I'll use a 10. Especially a 6 is really small. So I'm going to do the same thing with my musiolingual. You can see, and if these are hard to get into. So you can see I'm monkeying around. I'm going to rebend that file a little more, more of a curve. And then we're going to slide it down. Boom. Usually the file is going to spin around. Look at that. And here I did it again. I didn't make that space. I don't know what was going on this day. Oh, there's a bit of a space there. So there, tentatively what I'm going to do is I'm not going to put the hook all the way around. If I'm kind of just looking for a working length, I'm going to touch the outside of the, of the file clip holder to the file, kind of move it around, and then I'll clip it on just to get a better working length. So there we are there. Oh, yeah, I was trying to show you guys. I can't remember the working like this. Let's pretend it's like 18. And then we're going to irrigate. And then we're going to take our wave on gold. Now, the reason why you don't see me making a, a glide path in this case is because those files you saw just dropped a leg. So I'm not too, I'm not going to get, I'm not too worried about blocking out or not having a glide path. And I love this file because I can do that. So we're going to go right to length. There's a lot of irrigant in the chamber. You can see it right there. That's the beauty of having a rubber dam. I have a full chamber. And what you're seeing here is you're going to see me knock the file into the... So I'm going to use the irrigant. See how I just ran it back into the irrigant and out and all the debris fell off? That's essentially how I'm cleaning my file. I'm going to take that to length, pull it out. I'm looking for debris on the apical portion of those flutes. I'll keep going in the same canal until I don't see any debris. I see a little more debris there. And I decide we're not going to do that. So we're going to go into a distal canal. And what I do with a distal canal is I'm going to kind of use it like a, like a, kind of like a, uh, a brush. I'm going to brush all, try to get rid of all that pulp tissue, vital pulp tissue along the sides of the, the canal. So in this case, I am seeing a little bit of leakage, which is not ideal. So my, I know that aura seal, it's a different type of material, would have prevented this. So you got to be careful. So we're going to do our mesolingual. You can see here we're going down to a working length. I'm looking for debris when I pull that file out. See, this time I don't have as much irrigant in the, in the chamber. So I can't, you can see it's almost dry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to re-irrigate out. Irrigate all that stuff out of there. You know, the key to endo is just irrigation, disinfection. So let's keep going here. I'm going to irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. I'm going to place my file back in, go to length. You can see we're getting debris at the apical portion. What that tells me is that, yes, we're in the tooth because when I find that, if we're out, yikes. So we're going to redo my working length. Recheck with a 10, just to make sure we're not going long. So that's pretty straightforward. We saw that before. We're just using uh, cotton forceps just to get a little more accuracy. I had to monkey around with that one just to get the right length. Should have a really small opening. So same thing. I think everything was 18 mils. So there's that, 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 we irrigate out. And now what we're going to do is, I guess I just wanted to do my wave and go primary one more time. Usually I take the medium right away. So she's asking for a little bit of water. Try mouth. So we're still looking for debris on this file. Okay, so now we got our medium. I don't know what's going on there, <laughs> even though I did it myself. So here's our medium file. So this is the 3506 tip, and this is our finishing file. And what you're going to see here is we're going to place it down. I'm going to go to length. I'm going to pull the file out. Boom, I've got debris. So what this tells me is, yes, we're cutting the apical portion, so I'm getting rid of all the tissue that's at that apical part. And it tells me that I'm not outside the tooth, because when I find that when I get no debris at a certain part, then it's like, uh-oh, you got to think, like, have I gone too long? So now we've got debris again. I mean, this is just beautiful, clean dentin. But it tells you that, yeah, we're, we're cleaning and shaping. We're machining the inside of that tooth properly. 
and then we're going to do that again. I'm going to do this probably two to three times just until I make sure that there's no more debris. Because there's a lot of times, I'll, you know, I was trained to go once, but what I'll find is that if I go back a few times, um, the beauty of the reciprocation is it is pretty much self-centering. There's a number of peer-reviewed articles in the Journal of Anodonics about kind of reciprocation and self-centering. So we're not, you know, going two times is not going to zip or transport your canal. And honestly, I'm not going outside the working length. I'm staying internal to the tooth because I usually prep about a millimeter short of the apical constriction. And why I do that is to prevent uh, your working length shortens and especially curved canals. And what I've found is that if I go a millimeter, half a millimeter, even a quarter millimeter, I find that I'm right at the constriction or going uh, long because my tooth is shortening, shortening as I make the hole bigger, the machine the hole bigger. So there you can see we're just taking a look uh, again, just taking a look just because we can, I guess. We're going to irrigate lots. Lots and lots of irrigation. Then we're going to use our um, activator. Re-irrigate out. Make sure we're clean. So we're right on the 20 minute mark for the activate for the dissolution of irrigants and our vital tissue. So we're going to zoom right in there. We'll irrigate some more. So we're irrigating with hypo. And then I was thinking, you know what, I don't remember brushing the distal canal su sufficiently enough to make sure there's no vital tissue there. So I'm going to redo that. I'm going to rebrush, especially buccolingual because it is a wider canal buccolingual. Uh, redo with ear hypo. Then we're going to activate that one more time. And then what I'm doing here is while I still have some hypochlorite in the canals, in the canals, not like full of the chamber, you'll see here right before I do this, uh, I don't do it. So it's not right to the chamber, full of the pulp chamber. I'm going to check my, use my, uh, check my working length. And the reason why I'm checking here is because it gives me a few more minutes of full strength hypochlorite in the canal to dissolve any of that vital tissue. So we're checking our mesials. And I was curious to know whether or not these canals joined. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a curve 10 file. I'm going to place that down the mesiolingual and it kind of goes to length, kind of doesn't, but the real indicator is, let's see if you can see it with the light, is right here. See where that little groove is? It shows me that these canals are confluent or they join. You can see it right there. See that little mirror in my nose of the way. I do a bunch of different angles because sometimes it's really hard to see. Right there. So that tells me that what that is is a 10 file sliding right past. You can use a 15. So what I what that tells me is because it's confluent, we're good to go. And it actually reinforces, it gives me confidence that when I pulled one of my, I didn't show it here, but when I pulled it out, pulled out one of my Wave and Gold files, it wasn't fully filled with debris after I had done one of the other mesial canals. So I'm like, oh, okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm just doing a little bit of manual dynamic activation on my distal canal. So I'm going to pump it up and down a few times. Well, I think I'm going to. I'm trying to get a working like anyways. Okay, I didn't. Sorry. I thought I was going to do that. Okay, so we're going to dry our canals. There's our one huge distal canal. Our two mesial canals. You can see that this is kind of what I like to call the saddle. There's no, I don't see any white lines or white dots indicating that there's a middle mesial canal. Probability is pretty low. But we're going to check anyways. And then we're going to... Dry, finalize, drying, and actually what I'm doing here is I'm bending the paper point. So I'm, I'm placing the paper point into the canal, taking my working length, touching it. You can see it's going to bend the paper on the end, and then I'm going to measure. And that gives me an eye. Uh, that kind of validates in my own mind that, yes, my working length is good. So we're going to do that again. Same thing. I'm going to take my working length, pull it out, touch it. It's out of focus here. Touch it, bend it and then check for working length. So do that, successful times, a bunch of times there, boom, boom, boom. Oh, I think we're in suit and we're in focus there. We're getting better. So yeah, we're at 18. It's 
same thing here, 18. And then what we're going to do is we're going to place our sealer. So our BC sealer, we're going to place it in there. Then what we need to do is we're going to take a 10 file, run it to length. What I find is that there's an air bubble underneath you, underneath that, that uh, BC sealer. So I find that if I don't pop that air bubble, then I find it just, the, the rubber, uh, my gutter percha point doesn't go all the way to length. Sometimes and it can be quite frustrating actually. So we're gonna make sure we've broken that air bubble. We're gonna coat the walls as best we can. We're gonna take our gutter percha points. I've coated them with sealer. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. I don't know why I do. Sometimes I, I give it a little pump. We'll place the other one. The other one I've actually shortened. I've cut shorter because I know that they join. <coughs> and we place our distal. Boom. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a working knife. Uh, sorry, we're gonna take an X-ray. So you can see here, uh, I'm trying to get this in the microscope as best as possible. I'm taking the rubber dam frame off. So actually what my dental assistant does automatically, let's see if I have it here. She does it on, if I can see it. See that little hole? So what that little hole indicates is that that's always facing down. That's the lower right corner. So what that hole tells you is that after you make a mess with your rubber dam, after you take the frame off, that if you align that hole with the lower right, you know that you're good to go. This actually, this tear is what I normally do. This tear, this tear, I tear with the rubber dam just as I take the frame off. That tear automatically goes to the patient's right. I've been doing that for 15, you know, eight years, I guess. It works amazing because a lot of time is wasted trying to figure out how to put the rubber dam back on. So we're putting our sensor in. There we go there. And then we're going to line up our, this is just a regular. So what I've done now is I've been doing this long enough to know how to manipulate this. This is just a regular periodical radiograph holder. And what I do is I come a little bit lower and a little bit more distal to get this radiograph. Mm, this one. To get this radiograph right here. So I don't know what this is to get this radiograph right here. So you can see it's coming from a lower angle and it's distal, yeah, it's a cone cut, doesn't matter. But rather than, so I'm able to use that, Rather, I find that if a patient holds the uh, the x-ray, the radiograph sensor, it moves too much, still use a periodical uh, holder. But this way you get this, um, this image. So we're gonna take that x-ray, we're gonna put everything back on. You can see how quick that just happened. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, I want to put a little more sealer on one. I think it was, no, I just, what did I do? No, I just pumped them. So here I'm using my heat source. This is a touch and heat. Um, it's corded, but I'd highly recommend going a, a, with um, a cordless. I use two different kinds. I use uh, a B&L, which is a really expensive brand from... I don't know, I didn't buy it. I used it at one practice. It's amazing. I also use this eight teeth one they sent me. I've been using it for a year. It's just as good. A lot cheaper. So we're just burning off the... We're just searing off the tops of the uh, gutta percha. <coughs> this can be really frustrating. The key to this is use a large... Use a large ended with lots of heat. Go towards where the orifice is and cut towards the wall. No, nope, don't take a picture. Cut towards the wall and then sear it off. And I pack it down, rinse it out, and then once I rinse it, I'm like, okay, what's left? We got a whole bunch of extra junk. Clean that out. Same thing. I'm gonna sear that up, make it look pretty, make it look like you care. And then I'll pack that down, rinse it out. Let's see if we can get another good picture here. Rinse it out. So what I do here is I just take both air water syringe, both buttons on the air water syringe, and just hammer it. And you'll see me angle. That's not what I wanted to show you. There. So what's going to happen is I'm going to angle it all different angles just to make sure that it hits the air and water combined, hits every different little corner, nook and cranny in that preparation. So when we go to do this, we take our last final, take a look at it, it's nice and clean. So let's zoom in. There's our distal canal. There are two mesials. And then we're good. 
So because we're going to put our temporary crown back on, I'm just going to place a cotton pellet. Oh, there we go, nice and clean. Look at it. So there it is right there. Again, we've got no middle mesial canal that I can tell. There's our distal. This was a little more difficult to get in to take a look. So place a cotton pellet in there, pat that down. Doesn't need to be, I just need a thin layer of um, cavet because we're putting a temporary crown on. So a dental assistant of mine taught me this. If you mold it into like a little, a little cone, put it on your instrument and just place it down like that. Boom. Simple. Take that rubber dam off and then we put our crown back on and then that's it. So that turned out to be a little bit longer than I thought it would be. But thank you so much for joining. Hopefully, you know, place your comments about your types of rubber dam clamps that you use, you know, endo stuff you use, any questions, and we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.